This is ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Rosalind Russell in For Us, The Living. Directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware. International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. This is Conrad Nagel, ladies and gentlemen, bidding you welcome to the 26th in the new series of Silver Theater Productions. Today we present the first episode of a two-part drama which celebrates the return to the Silver Theater of the talented metro golden Mayor star, Miss Rosalind Russell, and now just a word before the curtain rises. For us, the living is a story of the America of tomorrow. Its characters are no real people. They're fiction. And no reference to any actual figures in the political world of today is intended or implied. Here, rather, we present the story of an idea and an ideal. The dramatic chronicle, if you will, of a woman and a man who put the nation that they love before all else. And certainly before themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, for Us the Living by True Boardman, starring Rosalind Russell as Ann Marshall, with Lindsay McCary as John Norman. The house lights dim, the silver curtain rises. The time, a night in August, an August of the future. The scene, the American Embassy in Brussels, an official ambassador's reception is in progress, and the main salon is thronged with a colorful assemblage. Here are nobility, diplomacy, and politics, each and all represented in their most formal and distinguished guise. Center of interest and of attention is an exquisitely gowned, gray-eyed woman who moves with dignity and assurance among her guests. This is Anne Marshall, American ambassador to Belgium. Et je me trouve enchanté de voir votre excellence. Ah, le plaisir est à moi, votre grâce. Et madame la duchesse Elle est disposée, mais, mais pas sérieuse. Ah bien, oh, pardonnez-moi. Euh, certainement, votre excellence. Lady Conway, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, thank you, my dear. And may I present Oh, Baron... but I know Baron Holtzman. We met in Vienna. Oh, I'm honored to recall it, Your Excellency. Believe me. <laughs> oh, don't believe him. He's been telling me for the last hour that you're a dangerous woman. Dangerous? Oh, your last book, <laughs> Ambassador Marshall, Tomorrow's Boundaries, is it called? Uh, I have just finished it. And uh, no woman has a right to know us in Europe better than we know ourselves. Therefore, you are dangerous, no? <laughs> uh, your Excellency, pardon me. Yes, Thomas. The message you were expecting, it has a Right. Oh, will you forgive me? Please? Oh, but of course. Well, it's news of the convention? Yes, the candidate for president was chosen on the 27th ballot. Who? Governor Norman. Oh, oh Miss Marshall, is, is something wrong? Wrong? John Norman, candidate for president, wrong? Oh, Thomas, I must go back in there, but I want you to send a cable for me. Of course. Send this message. Secretary of State, Washington. Earnestly request permission to return immediately. Washington pending resignation. Urgent personal reasons. Respectfully, Marshal. Ambassador Ann Marshall, Brussels, Belgium. Request granted. Return immediately. First and assumed duties pro tem Brussels legation. Shields, Assistant Secretary of State. Just a minute. You want a statement? Yes, Ambassador. What do you think about the presidential campaign? I haven't campaign? one for you yet. But if you'd all care to be at my home tomorrow at 3 o'clock, I shall have one. And now, if you'll excuse me, my father's waiting for me. I will pretend I'm not surprised, Anne girl. And, of course, I'm happy to have you home. But are you sure what you're doing is wise? Dad, this country needs John Norman as its president. Compared to that, whether or not Anne Marshall goes on being an ambassador to Belgium is pretty unimportant. Is it? I wonder. You know, Anne, right now, between your writing and your diplomatic work, you're probably as influential as any woman in the country. 
But when it comes to risking all of that, well, what I'm trying to say is this, Anne girl. Are you sure you know why you're doing this? Why? I haven't forgotten Prague, Anne. How long was it? Twelve years. John Norman is American minister, Dan Marshall is secretary. Your first diplomatic appointment of any importance. Yet within six months, you ask to be transferred. That's true. Well? What you're trying to say is, was I in love with John Norman and he with me? Isn't that it? Dad, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that question. Those six months in Prague, working with John, were the happiest I've ever known. That I am sure of. Well, then why Then did why you did I... I ask to be transferred? I was afraid. Afraid? Of myself, of what began to look inevitable. I think John was in love with me, or would have been. And I... Well, I only know that at the time, marriage... Even marriage to John Norman was less important than... Uh, than the ideal you gave me as early as I could understand. The ideal of service, Dad. A marshal's kind of service. And... John... Well, John has been my mighty being. I think we all need a might have been somewhere. And now you want to make yours president. Because of that? Now, you know that's not the reason. Yes, I think I do. He's the one man, Dad. Don't you think I've followed every move of his career? Look at his record in the diplomatic service, in Congress, as a governor. Look how he cleaned up corruption in his own state. Why, John has accomplished reforms that any politician in the country would have said were impossible. You see, he's got courage, Dad. Courage is what we need. I tell you, there is no choice. John Norman must be elected. Go right in, Ambassador Marshal. The governor will see you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President-to-be. Anne. Oh, Anne, it's wonderful to see you. Congratulations, John. I... Well, you weren't in here alone an hour after your nomination. <laughs> Afraid I was. Just... Just trying to make myself realize it. Oh, but you, Anne. Oh, you look wonderful. How long has it been since I've seen you? Four years. The president's dinner in Paris. You oh, remember, Oh, just that. A... You call that a meeting across 40 banquet tables? I mean to talk to you. Prague. That's the last time Prague. Eleven years ago. It's twelve... Remember that year? I do. Yes, John. I think I do remember. You were very young, very beautiful. <laughs> and very determined to revolutionize the diplomatic service. <laughs> Prague was your first post, wasn't it? Yes, John. My first post. Oh, what's the matter with me? Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. Smoke? No, thanks. Well, you've done fine work. You know that, don't oh, you? Oh, I don't know Oh, I get track of you. <laughs> Let's see, from Prague to Lima as vice consul, Lima to Java as consul, Java to Lisbon as minister to Portugal, and for the last three years, ambassador to Belgium, right? <laughs> you sound like an excerpt ep from who's who. <laughs> as a matter of fact, what about you now? Do you know that you added years to my life by going out of diplomacy into politics? Hmm? When you ran for Congress, I was in Java. It cost me 44 guilders worth of cables to make sure you'd won. Oh, you almost wasted your money. <laughs> <laughs> what was my majority that time? All of 250 votes. <laughs> and then each time you ran for governor, I'd find myself wishing I were here that I could help. But apparently you didn't need help. Not, not then. Not then? Say, you must have been reading the opposition press. <laughs> ah, but you're right. It is going to be a battle. A tough one. That's why I'm here, John. And I'm going to help if, if you'll just let me. Well, but Anne, you... Uh... An ambassador could hardly have a place in your campaign, I know. <laughs> but you see, I won't be an ambassador, John. I'm going to resign. Oh, but that's impossible. You can't do that. Oh, but it's very simple. I'm supposed to be an important woman. A woman other people in this country will listen to, particularly other women. Well, now I have something to say to them. Elect John Norman. Anne, this means more to me than you can ever know, but I won't let you do it. Don't you suppose I know what your diplomatic job means to you? Well, you've worked years for that ambassadorship. I've made you... up my mind, John. This is a bigger thing than you or me. This is part of... part of the scheme of things. 
I'm sure of that. Are you in? Yes, John. The nation needs you as president. And I want to do everything in my power to see that you are. Please. Please let me help. Very well, then. And I can only pray that you're right. For both our sakes. And with both national conventions ended, the presidential campaign is officially underway with Governor John Norman and Edmund Hubbard of California opposing Elliot Kendall and Carol Ames for the two highest elective offices in the land. An interesting sidelight on the campaign is the unexpected resignation of Anne Marshall for the past three years American ambassador to Belgium. Widely heralded for her skillful handling of the mid-European boundary dispute last October, Miss Marshall declared in a press interview today that she will campaign actively for the Norman Hubbard forces. And judging by the reports from Wall Street, candidate Norman can well use any and all support he can find. Setting a precedent. Now, Ann, we're not going to argue about it. You've been doing the work of six people ever since the campaign started. If you keep going on like this, you'll crack up. You've got to let down. That's all very interesting. Why don't we talk about it sometime? <laughs> John, that challenge Kendall made in his speech yesterday on the farm question, have you thought of your answer? And no. Because I think I have. I couldn't sleep last night till it came to me. Look, John, when Kendall was running for senator three years ago... And listen to me. Will you stop trying to carry this whole campaign on those shoulders of yours? And, uh... Twenty cities in as many days. Receptions, banquets, rallies. It's, it's too much. I know how much this means to you. In three but... weeks, the campaign is over, Dad. And then I'll rest for 20 years if you want me to. But this speaking tour is going to decide the election. And it is as a woman that I speak to you as women. The opposition has claimed that John Norman is no friend to labor. But where in his record as governor is there evidence for such a claim? If there is any man who has striven to heal whatever wound may exist between labor and industry, it is John Norman. And you here in the far west have certain problems of your own. I'm aware of those problems. And if elected, it would be the aim of my administration to solve... National situation from actual experience in the diplomatic corps. He speaks and acts from knowledge, not from theory. You must realize that a vote for Norman and Hubbard. My privilege on this final broadcast of the campaign to introduce Governor Norman to you. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a campaign speech. The time for that is over. What I have to say now, I say simply as an American speaking to Americans. Vote tomorrow for our candidates or against them as your judgment decides. But as you are citizens of a nation where the right to choose your own leader still is and shall remain your sacred privilege, go to the polls and vote. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Governor Norman. I shall be brief. The issues of this campaign are clear. Senator Kendall has given you his platform. I've given you mine. It only remains for you to decide. The, the presidential oath of office is usually only given at time of inauguration. May I say at this moment that whether I am elected tomorrow or not, I do solemnly swear that in whatever capacity it is my privilege to serve, I shall preserve, protect, and defend this nation and its constitution. Kentucky, 400 precincts reporting. Kendall and Ames, 4,332. Norman and Hubbard, 7,812. Another state, Governor. That's practically all the electoral votes you need. Now, we'll wait a while yet, Tom. You ever hear of the Hughes-Wilson campaign? Oh, that won't happen this time. Uh, no matter how well... Uh, a tabulation of the total vote thus far received from throughout the nation. Kendall and Ames, 1,970,000.
Norman and Hubbard, $2,640,000. So it would appear at this hour that the election of John Norman is virtually a certainty. That's it. You've done it, company. <laughs> I hope you're right. But still, we'll wait till they concede before we start cheering. And where's Miss Marshall? Well, she went home, Governor, just after the Pennsylvania and New York returns came in. She went... Well, Governor, Governor, you can't leave now, sir. You're supposed to broadcast. <laughs> away. Yes, John. I left early, as soon as I was sure you'd won. My boat sailed at 11 in the morning and I had packing to do. And uh, where are you supposed to be going? I'm not quite sure, John. Paris first. Uh, and you're then... leaving in rather a hurry, aren't you, Anne? <laughs> Acting on impulse is an old martial custom, I... Uh... Oh, forgive me. I, I haven't congratulated you. In the excitement, I... You know how glad I am for you. Yes, I believe I do. You're not going back to Europe, Anne. But I am, John. I must. You can't. You see, I need you. You... You need me? Did you really think I'd let you go like this? John. I haven't mentioned this before, Anne, because if the election had gone against me, it would have sounded hollow. But for three months now, I've been planning in my own mind the cabinet I'd select if I won. The cabinet. On some of the appointments, I'm still in doubt. There's one I'm sure of. The most important one. And I'm going to appoint you Secretary of State. Before we bring you Act Two of For Us the Living... Here's a man who'd like to make a bow in the direction of the lovely star of tonight's performance, Rosalind Russell. All right, John Conti. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we feel here that Rosalind Russell and the Silver Theater are old friends. For it was she who started us off so successfully two years ago. And I remember that Miss Russell told us then that 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate had been in her family for generations. And I think that you'll find that in the case in many homes throughout the country... For ever since that day, 92 years ago, when the house of 1847 Rogers Brothers first came into existence, the silver plate bearing that proud year mark has represented the highest ideals of beauty in design and craftsmanship. Among 1847 Rogers Brothers' loveliest creations is the pierced pattern love lace, gracefully proportioned with sterling-like detail and wreathed orange blossom motif, Love Lace is a pattern of exquisite charm, a design to be cherished a lifetime. And surprisingly enough, you can now get 62 pieces of 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate in the Love Lace pattern at a saving of more than $14 over open stock price. But let your silverware dealer show you sets of Love Lace tomorrow, Monday, and tell you about the easy, convenient payment terms. For there is no longer need to deny yourself the finest silver plate this country has ever seen. Silver plate by 1847 Rogers Brothers. The house lights dim, the silver curtain rises on Act Two of Part One of For Us the Living, starring Rosalind Russell as Anne Marshall with Lindsay McCary as John Norman. the third day of the following January. John Norman, inaugurated as president, has promptly made public his selection of cabinet officers, with Anne Marshall as secretary of state heading the list. And that news is a spark that fires the entire nation to a white heat of discussion. Impassioned, unbending are the conflicting opinions, opinions that find expression in every walk of life. A woman for secretary of state? Well, I won't stand for it. I voted for John Norman, but I didn't know he intended to wreck the country. I don't know. Why not? Give a woman a chance, I say. Some of the guys they've had in there haven't done such a hot job. Well, I don't care how many books she's written. I'm a woman myself. But when it comes to naming a woman to the most important post in the cabinet, well... I met Miss Marshall when she was vice consul to Peru. And I assure you that a keener analyst of international affairs I've never known. 
of the, of the organization go on record as opposing the appointment of Anne Marshall. And it's not just Washington or Baltimore or Philadelphia, John. The whole country is aroused. You can't send that recommendation to the Senate tomorrow. And why can't I? Because I won't let you. You must not risk your whole administration at the start because of me. Because of you. And two months ago, the people of this country voted me into office with one of the largest majorities a candidate ever had. That vote means that the people who elected me have confidence in my judgment. And it is my judgment that you should be head of the Department of State. What is it, John? Would I appoint you if it were not? They'll say I should be older. They're already saying it. What is age to do with it? Henry Clay was Senator 29. Hamilton was a cabinet officer at 32. But they were men, John. Why fool ourselves? I'm a woman. Was uh, Elizabeth a man? Was Victoria? No, but I... Oh, there's a difference, you'll say, but there's not. Not as regards one thing, that indefinable something called leadership. Leadership is where you find it, and ultimately it has nothing to do with sex. But if that's true, can we make the people believe it? The people? Mm. Listen to me, Anne. For the last two days, the people of this country have shown more interest in their government than at any time in 20 years. Washington, this government was in people's minds and people's hearts, and that's what I want. There's a word called patriotism, and But it's all too seldom heard, except in time of war. Well, I want a new patriotism. Do you understand? A patriotism of peace. A patriotism that grows of the people's knowledge and understanding and interest in the government that is their own. And you, as Secretary of State, will achieve that. Friends and enemies alike will be alert to watch your every move. People will know we have a foreign policy who never heard of it before. And that's what I want, Ann. A nation of active, thinking people aware of their own government. Patriotism of peace. It's a big idea, John Norman. You'll accept them? You know, John, we've never put this into words. Either of us. But I think we've understood... We own a dream, you and I. A dream that's more important to you than any woman. And more important to me than any man. It was because I realized you shared that dream that I left Prague 12 years ago. And now, if you'll swear to me, John, that you honestly believe that by accepting this appointment, I'll be helping to fulfill that dream, I'll do it. It will end. I swear to you it will. All right. If the Senate will back you up, I'll accept, John. And I'll try to do you proud. Anne! Anne! You shouldn't have waited up. Oh, but I've been waiting to hear the... Anne... And, girl, you didn't lose. No, Dad. I... I won. John did what no other president has ever done. He appeared before the Senate himself and asked that they confirm my appointment. And they did confirm it by a single vote. Vice President Hubbard himself had to vote to break the tie. But you expected a battle, my dear. Oh, Dad... Without John's speech, I'd have never had a chance. Will I be able to prove he was right? Will I be able to prove he was right? And with the new administration well into its fourth month, impartial observers, both in this country and abroad, have commented on the efficiency of the State Department under the regime of Anne Marshall. Today, as a matter of fact focus of national attention shifted from Washington to Wilmington, Delaware, where both President Norman and Vice President Hubbard were to address a banquet given by the Pan American League. Following the banquet, both the chief executive and the vice president were scheduled to return by automobile to the national capital. And now for the weather report. Continued storms along the eastern coast... forgotten there's such a thing as sleep, Anne Marshall? Dad! Oh, just about. This is a note that has to go off by cable in the morning. Couldn't sleep till it's finished. But darling, you mustn't let my crazy hours disturb you. No, nothing of the kind. In the middle of the night's my only chance to see you. <laughs> Dear Dad, 
And uh, how's it going, huh? All right. Oh, a few mistakes, maybe, but I haven't started any wars yet. <laughs> what does John say? Nothing much. I hardly ever see him except in cabinet meetings. But I think he's... Oh, I'll get it, Dad. Hello? Yes? Yes, this is Secretary Marshall speaking. What is it, please? Will you repeat that, please? And, and what is it? John. A motor accident on the road near Baltimore. Vice President Hubbard was killed instantly. John is in a hospital and not expected to live. <laughs> He's been asking for you. Dr. Lewis is with him. This way, please, ma'am. Se Secretary Marshall is here, Doctor. Oh, yes, Miss Marshall. The president has been... Ma'am. Is that you? John. John, are you all right? Doctor. Glad you got here, Anne. Not any too soon. A long road, Anne. A long road here... From Prague, 12 years ago. Yes, John. But it's a road that, that goes farther. Much, much farther. For you. But not for both of us. Funny, I... I half expected this. They tell me Hubbard... Yes. Instantly. <laughs> yeah. Poor Hubbard... At least, I could have gone first and given him an hour or so. Not afraid, Anne. Afraid? Yeah, a big job, you know. Maybe the biggest job there is. And it won't be easy. There are storms ahead that, that will take some fighting through. But, but you'll win. Because you're you, you win. I know. John, you mustn't. Just one last thing, Anne. That dream, the dream we talked about, it's still not fulfilled. I haven't done it. Perhaps I never would have. But you, you... John... President, I took the liberty of sending for the Chief Justice. He's just arrived. The Chief Justice? You have to. But surely you knew. With both the President and Vice President, well, the Secretary of State, the oath of office, Madam President. Yes. I suppose I did know. Would you... Would you ask the Chief Justice to wait, please? Of course, Madam President. Doctor. Nurse, please. For just a moment. Please. Yes, of course. Come, nurse. I'll try, John. As there is a God in heaven... And as it gives me strength, I swear to you, I'll try. This is Conrad Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen, ringing down the curtain on the first episode of our two-part drama, For Us the Living. And you know, as I stood here in the wings looking out at all the smartly dressed people in our studio audience, I was reminded of that old adage, clothes make the man. Then I got to thinking that in much the same way silverware makes the hostess. 
You'll be a more poised and gracious hostess if you know that the silver on your dinner table is a compliment to your taste and love for worthwhile possessions. Women who realize this own sterling silver. Because sterling is solid silver through and through. Silver to be enjoyed not just for a month or a year, but every day as long as you live. Go to your silverware dealers and just see the breathtaking beauty of International Sterling's new prelude pattern. Never were flowers more exquisitely carved than in the cluster of roses at the crown and base of the prelude handle. Never were pattern lines more graceful and rhythmic, nor solid silver more lustrous and lovely. Here is silver that will indeed form the, the prelude to many years of gracious entertaining. Surprising as it seems, ladies and gentlemen, nearly all of you can afford this new Prelude Sterling. For you can buy a complete service for 8, 12, or 24 people right out of income. Or you can get an individual place setting and start a service with six lustrous pieces as low as $16.75. Your silverware dealer will welcome the opportunity to show you the different sets. So be sure to visit him tomorrow, Monday and see the loveliest and newest of international sterling patterns, Prelude. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to extend to you in the moment we have left an invitation to listen to Rosalind Wassell in next week's episode of For Us, the Living. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Rosalind Russell as President Ann Marshall. In For Us the Living, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware International Sterling, world famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel greeting you from the stage of the Silver Theater in Hollywood and bringing you the 27th in our new series of dramatic productions. Next week, Silver Theater will star Chester Morris and Glenda Farrow. Other brilliant stars whose names already grace our guest book for future dates are Robert Montgomery, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Helen Hayes, and others. And now just a word before the curtain rises on today's concluding episode of For Us the Living by True Boardman. This is a story of the America of tomorrow. All incidents involved are fictitious, as are the characters concerned, and no reference to any figures in the political world of today is intended or implied. Here, rather, is the story of an idea and an ideal. Ladies and gentlemen, for us, the living. The house lights dim as the silver curtain rises. The time... The early hours of a winter morning. The scene, a hospital near Baltimore. In a small reception room just off the main corridor, three men stand silent, nervous, waiting. Two are secretaries to the President of the United States. The third is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. They look up expectantly as a door opens and the doctor approaches. Doctor, the President... I'm sorry, gentlemen. There was nothing humanly possible to be done. And the president is... A moment ago. President Norman literally refused to die until the secretary of state had arrived. But having seen her, I think he was content to go. This is all quite, quite incredible. Tell me, doctor, I understand the vice president... Yes. Vice President Hubbard was killed instantly, Your Honor. I attended the scene of the accident myself, and he was beyond all help. In that case, the Secretary of State must be sworn in at once. There couldn't have been a worse time for this to happen. With the unrest abroad, the threat of a general European war, it's... Madam President. Madam President. Believe me, Miss Marshall, we, all of us, share your grief. President Norman was... Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you. Miss Marshall, Madam President, you're not leaving the oath, Madam President. 
Oh. I suppose it must be now. I'm sorry, Miss Marshall. But technically, the nation is without a chief executive until the successor has been sworn. I understand. Your left hand on the Bible, Madam President. Your right hand raised. Please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear... I do solemnly swear... That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And will... To the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And at 3.54 this morning, for the first time in the nation's history, a woman became its chief executive. Succession of Anne Marshall to the presidency has already reawakened the nationwide controversy prevalent at the time of her appointment as Secretary of State. In every section of the country today, there is strong division of opinion as to the effect this startling new development will have on... A woman president. Brother, now I'll believe anything. Well, it's too bad a fine man had to die to bring women into their rights. But now we'll begin to show the men a thing or two. Probably wreck the country. That's what it'll do. A woman in the White House. (laughs) She'll bankrupt the Treasury in six months. How about appointments, Madam President? Who will replace you as Secretary of State? I'm appointing Mr. Will Taylor, the former assistant secretary. Well, don't you secretary. think the women of the country would expect you to name a woman? Well, Mr. Taylor is best well, how soon will we be moving into the White House? I'm not sure yet. Not From your experience as ambassador, do you think there's going to be war in Europe? I hope not. I, I think no one can be well, sure just now. What do you think now? of the so-called women's labor bill just passed by the House? I can't answer that. I haven't read the bill yet. What about the budget, Madam President? What And the act further provides that all women engaged in said industry shall... Uh, yes? Oh. Oh, Dad. Anne. Anne, girl, you're not going to work all night again tonight. I'm all right, Dad. Don't you realize you can't keep this up? Keep it up? Anne, ever since the very moment of that accident to John Norman... You've been driving yourself, giving press conferences, reviewing bills, working yourself to exhaustion. You've got to stop it. I can't. I wish I could. Dad, the moment I walked out of John's hospital room the other night, it was as though a curtain dropped, and every part of me that was capable of feeling anything had somehow ceased to exist. And... Do you know what John said to me just before he died? I can tell you his exact words. You mustn't be afraid, Anne. It's the biggest job there is, and it won't be easy. There are storms ahead that will take some fighting through. But you'll win. Because you're you, you'll win. And he was right. You will win, Anne. Oh, I must. We shared a dream, John and I. A dream for the future of this nation. It was because of that dream we... We gave up our love. And now, Dad, now I've got to fulfill that dream. Somehow I've got to fulfill that dream. Madam President. Oh. Madam President. Good good evening. Good evening, Madam President. And a sincere welcome to the White House. Thank you. I'm Mr. Connors, the chief usher. Uh, Your bags have arrived. Do you wish to go directly to your suite, Madam President? uh, Yes, I will. Uh, A personal maid, have you... Uh, That uh... won't be necessary for now. Uh, This way, Madam President, the, the elevator. Good evening, Madam President. Good evening. Oh, you needn't bother, Mr. Connors. This man can show me to my suite. Very well, Madam President. And uh, good night. Good night. What's your name? Zachary, Madam President. Zachary Ambrose. 
You've been in the White House a long time? Yes, ma'am. Right on to 43 years. My. Here we are, Madam President. Zachary, I want you to do me a favor. You see, this is my first time in the living quarters of the White House. Would you like to show them to me, Zachary? You mean be your guide, ma'am? Why, I'd be powerful on it, ma'am, President. Powerful on it. And this, this, ma'am, this here is the yellow room where they hid the pony. They hid the pony? Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt children, ma'am. They used to all the time ride their pony up here in the elevator. One time the pony was lost. We finally found it right here in the yellow room, eating the flowers that was in the vase on yonder table. Oh, Zachary, you lie like a gentleman. Now, these stories I'm telling you ain't no lies, Madam President. I'm telling you the truth. Zachary, where was Lincoln's room? You mean his special room, ma'am? Well, that's right here. I, I was taking you in there next. This, ma'am. This show was Mr. Lincoln's study. And President Norman, he, he done use it for his office. He sure did like to hear about Mr. Lincoln, President Norman did. So John Norman loved this room too, Zachary. Yes, ma'am. Right over there, ma'am. That's where Mr. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865. He started signing three times before he could finally make himself go through with it. It, it was all again, him, you know. The cabinet and all the rest. Yes. I I know. They were all against him. Zachary. Well, ma'am. I wonder if he was scared. Scared, ma'am? Mr. Lincoln? Gosh, I reckon so. Ain't everybody sometimes. Varying reports as the administration of President Ann Marshall goes into its third month. Although it is no secret on Capitol Hill that there is conflict between President Marshall and members of her cabinet, as well as with certain factions in Congress, those who predicted the country's economic collapse under a woman's administration seem to be proved false prophets. Dow Jones averages are generally higher, with only the constant threat of war in Europe preventing substantial rises. Meanwhile, activity in the White House is at an abnormal level. That an allocation for underprivileged children must be included in the bill, Mr. Thomas. Yes, Madam President. Secretary Taylor is waiting, and a Mrs. Noon. Oh. Miss Elam, please send in Secretary Taylor and ask Mrs. Noon to wait. Oh, very well. Oh, the state banquet, Madam President. You're going to decide about the main course. Who's the guest of honor? The British ambassador. Roast beef. Rare. <laughs> yes, Madam President. Oh, come in, Secretary Taylor. Good morning, Madam President. Come in, Will. I... Why, Will, what is it? You look concerned. So will you be. Looks like this is really it. War? A cable just came from Sproul in Paris. There's an unofficial report that the coalition powers have issued an ultimatum to the Western Alliance. Unless the Alliance will grant boundary and colony concessions by 8 o'clock, their time, the coalition armies will start to march. You think it's true? Don't you? Oh, I wish I knew. You know what it means if it is, Anne? It will be the greatest fight you ever fought to keep this country out. This country will keep out. It must. I have one more appointment, Will. Send in Mrs. Noon, please. But send me word at once if there's more news. I'll do that. Oh, oh I, I beg pardon your pardon. pardon. How do you do, Mrs. Noon? Won't you sit down? Thank you. <clears throat> Madam President, I came to talk to you woman to woman. Yes? I'm sure that you'll understand that I and my organization have only the best interests of this nation at heart. I'm sure of that. Miss Marshall, we feel that you should resign the presidency. I see. You have a reason for that opinion, I presume? Naturally. As a woman, Miss Marshall, you should have helped the cause of women. And yet you appointed a man to a cabinet post that you vacated. And you actually vetoed the women's labor bill. That bill was vicious. It would have harmed the cause of woman labor a dozen ways to everyone it helped. 
I happen to know that President Norman had decided before his death to veto that particular measure. Oh. And therefore, you couldn't possibly do anything else. Not if John Norman said so. Why, I... What do you mean by that? Mrs. Noon, I asked you what you meant by that remark. All right, Madam President, I'll tell you. And I'll tell you the real reason why we don't consider you a fit person to occupy the White House. We know why John Norman insisted on naming you Secretary of State, and it had nothing to do with politics. You were together in Prague when he was minister over 12 years ago, and uh, you were supposed to be his secretary. But you left there after six months. No one ever quite knew why. But that wasn't the end of the affair. Oh, no, Madam President. You met again a dozen Be times. Quiet. Be quiet, do you hear? Oh, things are clearer to me now. I've been wondering why the people couldn't seem to understand the things I've tried to do. I've even thought that perhaps an ideal for this or any other nation was just words. And no one ever wanted to see it brought to being. But I know now, Mrs. Noon, and I understand. It's you, you and all the others like you, who can cock your little eyes and then rejoice to whisper them on their way. Why? You who, if you prayed forgiveness till the day you die, would still be unworthy even to speak John Norman's name. Now get out of here. You heard what I said. Get out of here. Very well. You needn't think the women of this country won't hear of this, Madam President. Will you get out? <laughs> oh, John... John, they should dare their narrow, filthy minds. John. It's a big John. job, Anne. Perhaps the biggest job there is, and it won't be easy. There are storms ahead that will take some fighting through, but you'll win. Because you're you, you're with us. Madam President, I... I... Anne. Anne, what's wrong? No. You... You have news. What is it? War, Anne. War in Europe. The armies of the coalition have begun to march. War. Oh, God. Oh, God in heaven. Give me strength. In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the last of our two-part drama for us, the living. And while we're waiting for the curtain to rise once more, I'd like to say a word about International Sterling's new pattern in solid silver, Prelude. Like the inspired music it was named after, Prelude is a revelation in beauty. Its lines are rhythmic as a song, its proportions perfect. And the flower motif, carved with such exquisite delicacy and restraint, has a special affinity with the new romantic mood of today. And remember, ladies and gentlemen... Prelude is solid silver. Silver that says to all the world, here is a woman who has taste and background, a woman who loves beautiful, genuine possessions. Truly none but the most skilled of craftsmen could fashion this resplendent prelude sterling. But nearly every one of you can own it. And here's the man to tell you how. All right, John Conti. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to buy a complete set of prelude sterling, you can easily do so right out of income. Or, if you prefer... You can start a service by getting one or two individual place settings now and adding sets at your convenience. A place setting of six lustrous pieces costs only $16.75. But tomorrow, Monday, go wherever the best silverware is sold and see sets of Prelude Sterling. You'll be honestly thrilled by its beauty and amazed to realize that the kind of silver you've wanted all your life is now easily within your reach. Solid Silver by International Sterling. The Silver Curtain rises on the concluding act of For Us the Living, a story of the America of Tomorrow, starring Rosalind Russell as President and Marshall. The long awaited war in Europe has come to pass. In the air, on land, and on sea, the fighting forces are in desperate conflict. And as the fury mounts higher and even higher, it finds its counterpart in a steadily rising tide of sentiment within this country. 
a tide that uncontrolled can only lead to our participation in the war. American Embassy bombed. Read all about it. American Embassy bombed by coalition planes. Thanks, An American ship of 8,000 tons sank mysteriously in the Mediterranean. Evidence points to a submarine of the coalition navy. Bombing women and children, the coalition. Women Why doesn't that woman president of ours do something about it? We gotta stop them now, or they'll be over here to bomb our towns. So write the president into Congress. Let's make them understand we want to fight. Madam President, I speak for the Department of Wars. These other gentlemen speak for the respective houses of Congress in which they serve. The people want action, Madam President. They demand action. We are taking action. You call it action to merely send a note of protest when one of our ships is sunk by the coalition? These things always happen to neutrals in time of war. Don't you see I that I see it's... you're taking every means to avoid the real issue. That's what I see, Madam President. If you mean I intend to keep this country out of this war, that's true. But the people want war. I don't believe that, Senator. Some people may want war. The yellow newspapers of this country may want war, but the people, particularly the women, will stand for peace. I'm sure of it. Then how do you account for the telegrams, the letters? Each of us receives hundreds, even thousands every day. There is one cry in them all. War! Let's fight the coalition! And suppose they do say that. There was a time the people said, let's fight against England. 54, 40, or fight was a battle cry throughout the nation. But we didn't fight England. We found another way, and we must find another way now. Oh, please. Please believe me, all of you. If I were convinced this was a cause that justified the sacrifice of American lives, I'd do the thing you asked, gentlemen. I'd assemble Congress and ask for a declaration of war. But this war in Europe is not our battle, gentlemen. We would only make its horror greater were we to join. Believe me, believe me, our only course is peace. Gentlemen, I believe I warned you that we were wasting our time. Madam President, the members of this committee will give you exactly three days' time to change your mind. You will give me three days. And then... Then, if necessary, we shall take other action. Good afternoon, Madam President. Wait, gentlemen, please! Zachary? Huh? Oh, Madam President. <laughs> Madam President, you look powerful upset. It is... Zachary, huh? will you do me a favor? Well, you know I will, ma'am. I'm... Uh, I'm going into the study. You mean Mr. Lincoln's room, ma'am? And I want you to stay outside and, and be sure I'm not disturbed. Will you do that, Zachary? Will I? I so will me. John, I... I came here because somehow you always seem closer to me here. Maybe... Maybe it's because this was his room, too. And you and he saw things so much alike. I need help, John. I've tried, as I promised you I would. But now, I guess I'm just not strong enough alone. What should I do, John? You would have known. And so would he. Mr. Lincoln would have known. He had the same decision to make once. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't, John. Lincoln meant... Well, he set men to fight to save this nation. I wouldn't be doing that. I can't see how I'd be doing that. What is the answer, John? The answer you'd have given. The dream, Anne. The dream we shared together. I haven't fulfilled it. Perhaps I never would have. But you and you. The dream. I do remember, John. A patriotism of peace. 
that's what you wanted. I know now. I know now, John Norman. I am sure I know now. May come in, gentlemen. May I request that you be as brief as possible? The president has had virtually no sleep for the past three nights. Madam President has our sympathy, and we can be very brief. What is your decision, President Marshall? My decision is unaltered. I will not assemble Congress and ask for a declaration of war. Very well, then, madam. By tradition throughout American history, it has been the president who took the lead in declaring war. But never before has there been a chief executive who deliberately defied the will of the people. President Marshall, in case you're not aware of it, the Constitution states that it is Congress which actually declares war. And tomorrow we shall assemble on our own initiative and vote the declaration. Very well, Secretary Bates. You're right. I can't stop you. Come, gentlemen. But, Secretary Bates, in case you are not aware of it, the Constitution also states that the President is Commander-in-Chief of all armed forces. Vote your declaration of war, and I will not order a single man to fight. You wouldn't dare. We're only being constitutional, remember. Very well. You leave me no course. And I warn you, Madam President, I shall personally see to it that a resolution is introduced tomorrow asking for your impeachment. Impeachment? On what grounds? Treason, President Marshall. Plain and simple treason. Your secretary is correct when he says you had no sleep, and I know why. I have proof that you have for the last three days been in constant contact with the American representatives of the coalition powers, with the enemies of this country. And if this House requires further evidence in support of the impeachment of President Marshall, it is abundantly at hand. Quite apart from her unpatriotic attitude toward the war, we have sworn testimony that during the week just ended... President Anne Marshall was in frequent contact with agents of the coalition powers. And furthermore... I must interrupt the speaker. A news dispatch has just arrived which materially affects the resolution before this body. With the permission of the House, I will read this dispatch. At 2.52 this morning, an armistice was signed between the powers of the Northern Coalition and the Western Alliance. Basis for the armistice was secret mediation conducted in Washington by the President of the United States. Good evening, Madam President. I assure you that Washington has never known a reception to which I considered it a greater honor to be invited. My congratulations. Thank you, Senator. Uh, There was one question I wish to ask. Why secrecy in such a matter? Surely if we had known such... uh, Considering the temper of our own people, Senator, they might have disapproved of mediation. And besides, as it was, you and Secretary Bates and the rest were my allies. Your allies? You were my threat. The suggestion that I would agree to your demands went a long way toward making the coalition powers agree to peace. Madam President. Oh, Will, that demonstration outside, do you know what... Yes, I know what it is. It's a mob of your citizens descending on the Capitol. A mob? A mob of patriots, Madam President, who have suddenly discovered that what they wanted all along is peace. A patriotism of peace. And at the moment, what they really want is the sight of their chief executive. You'd better go out on the balcony, Anne. All right. Come, gentlemen. I think where we belong at the moment is out with that crowd. It's the beginning, John. It's not the whole dream, but it's the beginning. And we're on the road at last. This is Conrad Nagel again, ladies and gentlemen. I know you'd all enjoy a personal greeting from our lovely star... And Miss Russell will be back to speak to you in just a moment. First, I'd like you to hear about something that can bring you and your family lasting enjoyment. All right, John Conti. That something Conrad mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, is 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. Silver Plate of such striking beauty of design and superb craftsmanship 
that it has been recognized for more than 92 years as the finest silver plate in America. In recent years, this famous house has added still greater luster to its name by developing a technique that gives sterling-like detail to its gleaming silver plate. You can see it in the graceful pierced pattern Love Lace, a pattern delicately wrought which uses wreathed orange blossoms for rich ornament. Right now, 1847 Rogers Brothers offers this exquisite silver plate at substantial savings. A service for eight, 62 pieces in the Love Lace pattern can be purchased now at a saving of more than $14 over open stock price and on easy, convenient payment terms, too. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow, Monday, and see this gorgeous set. For this is your opportunity to own silver plate that bears the design prestige of America's first great craftsman, 1847 Rogers Brothers Silver Plate. And now to Conrad Nagel, who has brought Rosalind Russell to the center of our silver stage. Well, Rosalind, you have our congratulations on an excellent story idea in For Us, the Living, and on a wonderful performance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Conrad. I am very grateful to Silver Theater for having accepted the idea of doing a play about a woman president. And to True Broadman for his brilliant story and dialogue. I believe we touched upon something a little more important than just a play, and I hope others think so, too. And, Conrad, it's nice to work again with people who do such excellent radio programs as you and create such a lovely service as your new solid silver pattern prelude. It reflects beautifully the tradition of international sterling craftsmen. The very first time I saw it, I was thrilled beyond words. Oh, thank you, Rosalind. You're welcome, Conrad. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Rosalind Russell. Thank you so much. And back to us again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Rosalind Russell is co-starring with Robert Montgomery in the new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Fast and Loose. Next week, Silver Theater will star Chester Morris and Glenda Farrell. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.